Hi, I'm Raymond Simpson. I'm a museum assistant here at the Peabody Museum in Entomology. And today I'm going to uh, just show you a bunch of insects from Central and South America um, that are quite interesting from a biodiversity standpoint and also from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to kind of give you a nice overview of the various arthropod species. Um, that we see that are non non butterfly and moth actually. Um, so this is a good diversity, uh, good illustration of the diversity of basically non lepidopteran arthropods from the tropics. So lepidoptera would be butterflies and moths. So there's many other groups of insects um, that are basically reach peak diversity in the tropics. So you have everything from non insects like scorpions, um, scorpions, whip scorpions, tarantulas, um, and then centipedes and millipedes. And then you also have um, insects that vary from this large katydid, which is a type related to grasshoppers. You have these large plant hoppers, cicadas, um, roaches, and beetles. So today I'm going to just give you a little brief overview of a lot of this amazing interest insect diversity that is found in Latin America. So there's multiple themes that come into play when you're talking about insects in the neotropics um, with these type of insects and there are um, a couple. One is basically size which you kind of got an idea based on these. A lot of insects range from very small to very large as illustrated by a lot of these insects in the box here, this is kind of the large size variation in insects. Um, but you could see that there's, it ranges from basically the largest, like this is one of the largest grasshoppers in the world, um, but there's also grasshoppers that are much smaller, under an inch in length. So there's grasshoppers that range from basically a few centimeters to nearly, like basically a, like a 10 centimeters across. Um, and there's a lot of variation in both size and shape. So here we have a, basically these are two types of orthoptera, which are crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers. This is a winged grasshopper, but this is a wingless cricket. This is like a weeda ground cricket. Um, and this up here is a wingless katydid. And Entomologists studying these can tell them apart by subtle differences in morphology. Um, so there's a lot of variation from huge to very small, but the most striking thing you can note in arthropods in the tropics is what we call sexual dimorphism. And sexual dimorphism is, is basically f the sexes of insects, the male and females, have different morphologies. So dimorphism means there's two different morphs based on the insect being male or female. So in this beetle, this is called the Hercules beetle, very common through Central America. Um, the male, which is on the bottom here, has these really cool horns. And I will get him out very carefully. So the male Hercules beetle has these weapons, that basically what they are, um, for not only impressing a female, um, but also fighting with other males. So they have this like multiple horned um, protuberances that help it fight other males. So the males will actually line up with each other and fight each other. And whoever, whatever male knocks the other male off their perch wins. And then the females, which don't have horns, um, will choose them because they're obviously the fittest of the males. So the females are generally of most scarab beetles are a lot less ornamented than the males. Here's another example of a Hercules beetle. You can see the, the horns being quite long and ornate in a lot of these. Some of these dynasties or Hercules beetles can get quite big. So you can see compared to my hand, this is a very large stag beetle. And you could tell by the horns, the horn morphology is different in each species. So if you get, a, if you get an individual of each of these beetles, you can tell what species it is based on the horn shape. 
another type of beetle with this interesting dimorphism and basically uh, like an adaptation is this um, cerambicid or longhorn beetle. You might be like, why the heck does it have such long legs like that? Um, you could tell it's a longhorn because it has long antenna, but what are these long legs for? But the males in these are actually using these in a basically territorial as, um, fashion to basically display and to challenge other males. So if you see any sort of, there's a pretty wide variety of these adaptations that insects have. And if you see these extreme adaptations in any insect, either of color, shape, or ornamentation, that usually indicates some sort of sexual selection is going on, um, where the females are actually choosing males based on these interesting and extreme ornamentations that they have. So going back to what I mentioned about size, size is very important to insect diversity because different sizes allow for different niche space, niche being the place, the, basically the role that the organism has in its environment. So if you have different sizes of, these are all praying mantises, for example, if you have different size praying mantises, they could occupy different niches. So you could have smaller ones interacting in the same environment with larger ones. Where if you have a single praying mantis like you do in the, in like the northeastern United States, you have one species and that's it. Not a lot of insect diversity is possible um, if you have one size. So if you utilize multiple sizes of insects, you could fit a lot more diversity into a particular area of forest. So these are actually types of mantid. Like this here is called a, um, a hooded mantis. And these actually sit on the tops of like banana, like basically large, broad, shiny leaves. And they perfectly blend in to their background. And this is a more typical mantis, similar to the mantids you get in the United States um, with the typical raptorial forelegs that you can see here for grasping the prey. Um, and then you have smaller, more bark mimic mantises that actually mimic bark. They actually sit on bark and you can't see them when they're on the bark because they're so perfectly camouflaged. And then you have these small, um, these small species which actually mimic other types of insects. Mimicry meaning they look like them. So these actually mimic wasps. So these mantids actually look like wasps. So they not only are able to sneak up on potential prey by looking like a completely different type of insect, but they're also able to um, uh, have the mimic, the, the protection from potential predators by looking like a wasp. So you kind of have this double usage of this um, mimicry that they use. Um, another good example of a large insect that you probably don't ever want to encounter or get stung by, <laughs> this is called a tarantula hawk. So a tarantula hawk is feeds on tarantulas, as you'd expect. So you can see this is a typical tarantula that you'd find in the tropics. Um, but these wasps are adapted to kill them or paralyze them and feed them to their larva. So uh, one of these wasps will actually go over, flip this over on its back, sting its belly where it's less protected, and then drag it across the ground. And when the wasp brings it to its burrow, it'll put this body of this paralyzed spider into a burrow and lay eggs on it. And the larva will actually eat the spider um, alive, which is kind of brutal. But because they are adapted to hunt such large prey, these pepsis wasps have become so like gigantic um, that their, their stings are very, like you don't want to get stung because they are very, very painful, but they don't tend to be very aggressive. So as long as you leave them alone, they're only interested in spiders. They're only interested in hurting spiders, not humans. So we kind of touched on a little bit um, when we're talking about size and size diversity, um, but another very important thing about tropical insects is camouflage. And with a lot of these non-insect arth or non-butterfly arthropods, they're more worried about getting eaten because they can't fly. So a lot of these will tend to look like things that aren't edible. So the walking stick is probably something a lot of people have heard of, but the walking stick is the best example of mimicry of a non, basically a non-living thing. 
So these, imagine this on a tree, would be almost perfectly camouflaged from predators. So in the case of some walking sticks, you have this very large one here on the bottom. It's hard to see. This is a very large species, but you can tell compared to the one I showed you before, this is a lot thicker and more textured. So it's adapted to live in a different area than the, the more gracile, skinny walking stick that I showed you before. So this one is going to be camouflaged on like a, a prickly bush, like a pricker bush or something, a brush that has some roughness to it. Um, this is another type right up here, a little bit bigger. So he, um, while I have this on, we have some, a lot of people are familiar with plant hoppers in their gardens. In the tropics, you get giant plant hoppers. So these, this one here is called a peanut bug because its nose is elongated into this really cool inflated um, projection on the front. And as you'd expect, um, this is for display. This is for attracting a mate. So the males with the most inflated noses are selected um, to reproduce. Um, so a lot of these plant hoppers are important predators of plants by sucking the juices out of the stems. But they also reach fairly impressive proportions in the tropics. Um, cicada, which a lot of people are familiar with, and its head just... <laughs> um, the cicada is very well known for being more like this size in the United States, but this is what they get to be in the tropics. And just imagine how loud that is when that thing's buzzing. <laughs> So finally, I'd like to finish on basically diversity of color. Um, and beetles are the most numerous, basically the most numerous arthropod group on the planet. Probably millions, <laughs> definitely hundreds of thousands of described species, but probably in the range of millions of species when it's all said and done. And this is just an example of some of the amazing diversity within a very small group of beetles called the jewel scarab beetles. And these jewel scarabs are range from just kind of normal browns all the way to this brilliant green. Some of them are literally chrome. They look like they've been dipped in chrome. And it's, it's the jury's still out on what, what the, the adaptive advantage of this chrome is. But green is apparent because just like the hooded mantis, they could blend into plants very well, these green ones. And then the brown ones are very good to blend in with ground, basically ground debris and leaves. Um, so a lot of these jewel scarabs are um, basically found throughout Latin America and they commonly come to light so a lot of people like to collect them and observe them because they are um, quite easily to see. So in entomology there's a lot of things to study and a lot of ways to study. There's a lot of life history we don't know. A lot of biodiversity is completely unstudied. And anybody from somebody like me to the, any, or any citizen, even the untrained person that doesn't know much about insects, can contribute to entomology by simply getting out and studying and learning and observing. And you too could make um, positive contributions to entomology. Plus, they're just really beautiful and fun to look at. So thank you very much. <laughs>